Hello everyone, welcome to LinkedIn Sales Solutions Executive Series, where we bring in insightful conversation with global leaders across different industries, where they share their perspective about trends that really matter. In our last conversation, we had Oreka Haugen, the Chief Communication Officer from DNB, where she shared how sustainability is now part of their growth strategy. Today, I'm very excited to bring you another leader, uh, Pijay Singh, who heads the global business for DKSH Healthcare. DKSH is a global service provider for healthcare and medical devices, which are specialized in Southeast Asia market. Bijay has over 25 years of experience in healthcare and has spent six years plus in DKSH Healthcare. And before joining DKSH, he worked with large healthcare organizations like Novartis and Eli Lilly. Hello, Bijay. Welcome. Welcome to Take the Lead Executive Series. How are you doing today? Really good. Pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot. So we're going to start today with a typical LinkedIn way of introducing our guests. So share something that's not on your LinkedIn profile. Um, wow, there's a few things I could share. Uh, I'm a father of three kids. Um, okay. They're in their 20s. Really proud of them, all doing different things. I uh, like to play golf. Um, I don't play as much as I used to, okay. doing a bit of travel, uh, but I hit my best score the other day, so I was very, very happy with that. Um, and uh, lastly, I just this month um, have been um, reached 30 years with, uh, with my wife. So wow. um, yeah, we, we met thir uh, 31 years ago, got married 30 years ago, and loved my life, <laughs> met her. And we proposed, um, I proposed, and a week later we were deciding to get married, got married a year later. So those are three things about me um, that are normal LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this. So what's your handicap? Just curious. Uh, it's, it's high. It's, it's around 14. Yeah. Fantastic. Not that bad. Uh, because mine is 18. So 100% you're a better golfer than me for sure. OK, let's get into uh, some business conversations. Uh, one of the things that I'm very curious about is how Southeast Asia market is shaping up, especially in the healthcare sector. Post-COVID, things have drastically changed. So what's your point of view on Southeast Asia market now, post-COVID? How is it panning out, especially in healthcare? You know, we talk about Southeast Asia, but really you're talking about a collection of several different markets um, within ASEAN itself. I mean, you've got small emerging markets like mm -hmm. Laos and Cambodia coming up, mm -hmm. and then you've got very large, um, high potential markets. So the, the countries that people and companies often talk about are, you know, what they call the VIN countries, Vietnam, mm -hmm. Indonesia, uh, 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 Philippines, sorry, VIP countries, VIP. Okay. And um, uh, these are countries with large populations, growing fast, mm -hmm. uh, huge opportunity, and provide quite different opportunities depending on the segment that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, my bet in terms of the exciting country right now is Vietnam. Okay. Um, it's, it's facing some short-term challenges, but I think uh, if you look at overall population, if you look at uh, aspiration, um, certainly, I think Vietnam is probably the one country where almost every um, client I talk to is, is super interested in. Uh, you're talking about a population of 700 plus million in, in Southeast Asia. And I think the slowdown that we've seen in China mm -hmm. is also causing a lot of companies um, to look at, at Southeast Asia as perhaps providing some kind of bulwark in terms of always depending on China, so I think there are lots of lots of trends um, mm -hmm. um, that are driving still a robust growth in in many countries in, in okay. Southeast Asia. Okay, that that's pretty interesting. And you know, I was uh, reading through a report which said Southeast Asia market uh, in general is close to 1.6 trillion dollar in healthcare. It's huge. It's huge. Um, and one of the and one of the challenges that you spoke about is it's not one country. These are like multiple countries. Um, and we've heard the whole challenges around logistics and supply chain. It's not easy. What's your point of view on logistics supply chain in future in these markets? And how do you deal at DKSH with that? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, again, goes country by country. You take mm -hmm. a country like Singapore, 
It's very simple, you know, very simple logistics and distribution here. It's pretty straightforward. Then you go into other countries like Indonesia, Philippines, even Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, um, much more challenging. You go one step further into Myanmar, mm -hmm. where you have huge issues with respect to cold chain, uh, mainly because it's, it's hard to have the infrastructure, hard to have the, um, the uh, electricity uh, that you need that's, that's uh, reliable. Mm -hmm. So there are lots and lots of challenges um, in terms of cost to serve, in terms of reliability, um, in terms of cold chain. And um, so I think that means that companies look to, to uh, or clients look to companies like DKSH. Why? Uh, because we put quality as a non-negotiable. Um, okay. uh, we're also a publicly listed company. Uh, we deal with clients that that are also often publicly listed and very, very quality conscious. Um, and you know, we have to put the backups in place. We have to provide the data. The, the second part I'd talk about is, as much as possible, we try to do what we call capillary distribution, where okay. we can check where the the product is at any time. We know where it's being delivered. Um, that gives us great um, uh, advantages in terms of data, mm -hmm. gives us great advantages in terms of pricing, in terms of the quality of product that's been de uh, being delivered, um, but it comes with a cost. Got it. Yeah, no, makes absolute sense, especially in the market which is more fragmented. Right. Uh, everybody is talking about generative AI nowadays, open AI and, uh, and Bard with Google coming up with that. How do you see AI or generative AI changing the game in healthcare? I think generative AI in healthcare is going to be a, a big game changer because of the huge amount of data that uh, that's out there in in various pockets. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to have a, a game changing effect in research. It's going to have a game changing effect even in epidemiology and identifying patients. How we're using it potentially is not yet G generative AI as mm -hmm. as much as you know, preliminary AI, so we're using uh, RPA or robotic uh, process automation a lot. Um, we have a number of um, customer touch points, and what happens quite often is the type of um, inquiries that we get, uh, they tend to be pretty repetitive, mm -hmm. and therefore we think we can use RPA. We think we can also use more and more machine learning because often we get um, uh, orders can you believe we still have orders faxed to us wow. um, or emails? And rather than having humans look through those, we, we see that we can use machine learning to, um, to scan those orders and um, process them faster. So mm -hmm. we have, in many cases, um, you know, open servers sitting there without humans behind them that are actually helping process these orders much more efficiently mm -hmm. with lower mistakes. Um, so those are a couple of areas where we're using AI. Uh, there are also classic areas around marketing, around communication, et cetera. But I think looking at the huge amount of data that we have, mm -hmm. uh, the number of orders that come in, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more that we could be doing um, in, in, in taking that data and understanding what insights could we drive? Um, what could we be helping clients in terms of inventory movements, in terms of order patterns, in terms of sales forecasting, um, in terms of re reducing out of stock? I think there are plenty of things that we yeah. could be doing, um, but I, I have to, to be honest and say we're, we're still very much at the early stage of the game. And I know that you know partnering with LinkedIn, I think we, we could find lots of areas that we could we could benefit from what you're doing in, in generative AI in terms of uh, perhaps how um, uh, clients are, uh, are um, working with our data or using uh, the posts that we have. So um, we're, we're very keen to understand how you could use generative AI to help us um, identify you know, potentially clients that would be interested in coming here to Asia to work with um, work with companies like DKSH. A couple of questions uh, on kind of double clicking onto this. One of the things that uh, I've been hearing a lot is healthcare companies moving into Asia market and Southeast Asia market. And LinkedIn data shows those connections being made. 
So if any company that has to come here in this side of the world, what are the things that they should be aware of uh, from a complexity perspective? Yeah, I think number one, from a regulatory perspective, they have to understand um, what the requirements are to register. You've got certain countries, including where we are today in Singapore, where it's very, very quick. Um, you can take uh, information from uh, major country registrations and actually use them in Singapore and very rapidly get, get approvals. You've got other countries, Cambodia is one, where it can yeah. take up to three years wow. to get regulatory approval. Um, uh, so I think point number one is you have to really understand uh, what the regulatory um, landscape is. I think mm -hmm. number two is um, what the go-to-market model should be for, for you. Um, and many, in many cases, companies decide that there are only a few markets where they want to have their own direct presence and mm -hmm. otherwise they'd rather you know work with a partner like us mm -hmm. um, because it it's expensive to put that yeah. in place um, uh, certainly as you go to more and more channels I think thirdly I would say is to understand the healthcare system um, who pays how do you get it how do you get uh, reimbursement um, is your uh, is your product more geared towards the pharmacy channel, the hospital channel, the government space, the private space, is it going to be pay out of pocket or is it going to be somewhat um, um, paid for by a payer? So all these things, when we talk to clients, these are the questions they want to un answer. You can't just copy paste um, you know, a European or a, you know, a single country in, in, in Europe or, or the United States or even in Australia and bring that to Asia. You find with the 14, 15 markets that we serve in Asia, you know, there's almost almost always a bespoke uh, model that you need for, for the same company, sometimes with the same product. Awesome, yeah, I love the fact that, you know, they would have to think about regulatory, GTM, how government's gonna play a role, and even the per capita income of different, these countries are very, very different. So the models would be very different. So what you're suggesting is if anybody wants to invest here, needs to kind of understand the complexity from all the angles. One of the things that um, uh, a lot of leaders now are talking about sustainability, uh, especially in the Southeast Asia market, where we saw like climate change kind of creating massive impacts. We had flash floods happening all over. What, what do you think uh, from a DKSH's perspective sustainability and how you go to market with that is going to play a role? It's becoming even more important for our clients. They want to know what our sustainability plans are. Mm -hmm. um, they want to understand what we're doing to help them. Everybody now has um, a clear agenda that they need to be talking about uh, to their own investors, to their own employees. So it is something that we are investing more in and in fact in healthcare, brought in a full-time sustainability manager to help us drive our um, drive our program. So let me give you a couple of examples mm -hmm. of where I think we've made a difference. So um, we recently built a fully automated um, um, distribution center, healthcare distribution center, the okay. first fully automated one in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and and um, just actually launched it a few months ago. Um, What's exciting about it is you walk around that distribution center, mm -hmm. you don't see paper. It's okay. everything is done electronically. The second thing is we've installed um, uh, solar power uh, on the roof. Okay. And so we have um, put in systems where we capture the power, uh, store okay. it overnight, and it's really drastically reduced our, um, our footprint in terms of um, the use of electricity. We've replicated that also in a new distribution center we recently built in Laos where we, it's much smaller, doesn't, not fully automated, mm -hmm. but one of the things we're trying to do much more is, is use more renewable energy. Okay. The second type of thing that we're doing is uh, a big part of our um, use of, of energy is in transportation. Okay. And we're investing in in um, electronic uh, electric vehicles. Okay. We're also looking again at our routing of the trucks and looking at how can we make that more efficient, reduces the use of um, of fuel. Uh, also, the size of trucks that go out. Do we mm -hmm. do we always need one size of truck? 
how do we um, you know make that more customizable mm -hmm. um, so we've done lots of things in transportation mm -hmm. and then I'd say many more things in the community I think a big part of being a sustainable company is also giving back within your community so uh, we'll be launching uh, in the next month uh, our uh, partnership um, to with with the Red Cross in many many countries and we'll be doing um, uh, building off patient safety day and re-emphasizing re our purpose which is enriching people's lives and doing activities a lot of them um, related to to health and people's own personal health and our employees own personal health uh, so I think those are just some small parts that we can mm -hmm. play um, in sustainability I oh, love that, love that how technology is weaving into sustainability and then thinking about people, thinking about organizations and thinking about uh, purpose-driven business uh, and people are up for it. We've seen those trends coming up massively in this idle world. Um, my next question is around your vision for DKSH. Uh, you've been specialist in healthcare and medical devices in this side of the world. What's your vision for DKSH healthcare uh, in the next few years? I think there is going to be an even bigger need for companies such as ours to help clients with go-to-market models in, in Asia. We see um, particularly medical device companies mm -hmm. uh, coming up with lots of innovation, very exciting products, and needing to figure out how to get them to market. Um, we are, I, I think, still doubling down on Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. We've expanded recently in the Philippines and Indonesia uh, and Australia and New Zealand. So we see um, much more opportunity to grow. We're still very small in those countries. Okay. Um, so we need to go outside of our, our big countries, which is, you know, Thailand is certainly one where we have almost 30 percent of, uh, of our footprint. Um, so one of our visions is to expand within Asia um, um, we see lots of opportunities for medical devices and we also see an opportunity um, for our own brand. So we think mm -hmm. that uh, uh, there is opportunity as we look at private label and as we look at purchasing uh, IP rights of, of products that maybe other companies don't, don't want to invest in. Mm -hmm. And we can leverage our commercial footprint um, and, and drive more value for those products. Amazing. So, so it's going to be more of, you know, expanding the markets. You're looking at uh, what you can pick up as an IP, and then of course, growing your capabilities. Now, with that, um, I I know one of the core focuses for you is to bring in all these global companies here, um, and LinkedIn helps uh, organizations connect to people and expand their, uh, you know, relationships across different boundaries. How are you leveraging LinkedIn at this point in time? Yeah, thanks a lot. So we've been partnering with LinkedIn for many, many years now. I remember when I joined DKSH in 2015 as the head of business development, uh, we were using LinkedIn actively. And I think as you've grown, particularly your sales navigator product, it really helps us uh, identify decision makers and, um, and perhaps um, some new companies. So I think one of the key ways uh, that, that LinkedIn can help is identifying what we call white space opportunities. So mm -hmm. there are plenty of companies that we don't know about. Everybody knows the large companies, um, but there are plenty of um, what I call sweet spot companies, mm -hmm. smaller, uh, with very good technologies, very interested to grow in Asia, but not knowing who to talk to. Mm -hmm. So I think a key um, area we can work on is that. I think the second is um, how to have very good conversations and engagement mm -hmm with the key individuals. So a lot of that is engaging with them. Um, it could be on, on posts, it could be directly through messaging, mm -hmm. but um, I think increasing our engagement with those, with those potential clients is super important. And I think what we also see is a huge churn in decision makers um, and people moving in and out of the company, which is very hard to track. So I think LinkedIn uh, gives us an opportunity to see those, get prompted, um, and then introduce ourselves to new decision makers as they, as they move into you know, responsibility for Asia. And I think something I learned today just in, in, the, in the chat we had just before this podcast 
is the, the number of decision makers that are actually sitting outside of Asia. So yeah. I think LinkedIn gives us a chance to understand you know, where they're sitting and reach out to them. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay. It was a pleasure having this chat with you. Take Thanks care. a lot. Bye-bye.